morning and can I welcome everyone to the ninth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018 and can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. We have received apologies for today's meeting from Oliver Mundell. Michelle Ballantyne is attending today in his place. Tavi Scott and Ross Greer are attending the Finance and Constitution Committee's Stage 2 consideration of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill this morning and have also passed on their apologies. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take Agenda Item 4 in private, which is a review of the evidence from the Minister. And is everyone content that Agenda Item 4 is taken in private? Thank you. The next item of business is the second of a series of three Ask the Minister evidence sessions. Today we will hear from the Minister for Employability and Training. And can I welcome Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Employability and Training, Victoria Beatty, Head of Workplace Equalities Team, Directorate for Fair Work, and Dr Paul Smart, Deputy Director of Advanced Learning and Science in the Scottish Government. I understand, Minister, you'd like to make a short statement. Uh, no, Convener, I'm quite happy to be on thanking you for the invitation today to to move straight into your question and answer session. That was an incredibly short statement. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, as you're aware, Minister, the committee invited suggestions from stakeholders and members of the public for today's session and can I thank everyone who's contributed. We'll ask questions in person today and anything that is not asked now will be sent to the Minister for a formal response for the committee, to the committee. All responses will be shared by those that ask the questions. Before I invite questions from members of the committee, I'd like to start by asking a question we've received from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. And that is, what have local authorities been asked to do to ensure that the DYW agenda is seen as a priority within their schools? Uh, that's a, a fair question, a convener. I suppose I would answer it in the sense of it's not so much asking a local uh, government to do anything beyond working with us uh, as, uh, as a partner and similarly you could uh, ask local government what have they asked of us uh, and it's in that vein that we uh, are taking forward the developing the young uh, workforce uh, agenda uh, collectively and uh, together. Um, so on, on that basis it isn't really that we ask them to do much uh, more than uh, beyond ensuring that within the uh, school environment of course they have responsibility as the education authority in their respective areas to ensure that that uh, ethos is being uh, bought into uh, in uh, the particular uh, schools that they have responsibility for. Uh, of course, we uh, can help facilitate that and through Education Scotland, uh, we work to uh, assist uh, schools uh, take forward the, that agenda. Um, uh, each school should have a, a DYW uh, lead officer who is responsible for ensuring that DYW has been taken forward as part of the, the life of the school. And uh, through Education Scotland, we'll be uh, regularly engaging with uh, those leads to, to ensure that they can uh, share practice and ensure uh, effective coordination of efforts uh, across Scotland and within their specific school. Can I ask, further to, thanks for that answer, but can I ask further to that, the, what guidance would you give to local authorities to ensure that schools are giving the same, that there'll be, I'm sure there'll be further questions about this later on, but are giving the same importance to things such as apprenticeships as they are to further edu and higher education? Well, again, I don't think it's so much a case of providing guidance to local authorities. Uh, my estimation, I, I mean, if you look at it, the way DYW is structured, for example, we have a, a national group that's jointly chaired by the Deputy First Minister and the uh, cause of the lead uh, on these uh, matters, Councillor uh, Steve McCabe from Inverclyde uh, Council, he, he leads on these issues for uh, for COSLA. So uh, again, it's it's a it's a joint uh, effort. So it's not so much having to uh, provide guidance to to local government, but uh, ensuring through uh, the prism of local government uh, through uh, that partnership approach that they are working with their schools to uh, ensure. Uh, that uh, the vocational pathway is of uh, equal importance and just as uh, as important as the uh, academic pathway. So uh, it isn't really a, a case of having to issue guidance, it's about trying to uh, ensure that through uh, the uh, work of the national group and of course the, of critical importance here are the 21 regional groups that we've established, they're much closer uh, to the, the local environment by their nature, by being regional groups. And they'll be the ones that are interacting with schools on a, a regular basis to ensure that there's that ethos is embedded in the school environment rather than having any form of, of guidance. Okay, so thank you for that, Ruth. Uh, Good morning. Followed by Michelle. 
Good morning, Minister. Um, last week was Modern Apprenticeship Week, and um, like many colleagues, I took part in that with a and had a visit to Irvin Paper Mill, where I met a um, very interesting and a bright group of modern apprentices at different phases of their apprenticeship. Um, they all had one thing in common, which was that they hadn't been told about the possibility of apprenticeships in their school time. They'd all come to it later on. Now, these are young folk in really high quality um, apprenticeships. They've got good job prospects within our local community. Um, in, in, the, in you know, following that path. So just, I suppose, seeing um, in our um, report here that, that one of the things that further progress was needed in was in um, employers taking young people straight from um, education. I just wonder if you could say a bit more about, um, you, you said a bit there in, in answer to the convener, but what else is gonna be done to make sure that modern apprenticeship is, you know, has the parity of esteem um, that university has, for example, mm -hmm. and that people know that there are these really, um, as I say, high quality um, pathways that, that young people can take. Yeah, well, this is uh, something I encounter as well when I'm uh, out and about. Uh, it won't come as a surprise to the committee that similarly to Ms Maguire, I was out in uh, arranging visits for Scottish Apprenticeship Week given uh, my uh, role. And I have to say, I, I find the picture to be quite mixed. Um, but I would agree that there is still a significant number of uh, people who uh, come to an apprenticeship without ha having been discussed as an option whilst they're in uh, the school environment. Uh, increasingly, I think that's less the case. Um, it's unfortunate that was the case for all of the apprentices uh, that uh, you spoke at, uh, spoke with, um, rather than that. Uh, when you undertook the visit in your own uh, constituency, Ms Maguire, but uh, I find uh, that increasingly there are those who are engaged in apprenticeship, who will say it is uh, discussed within the school environment. But it is patchy. Uh, I think developing young workforce is a uh, contribute to changing uh, that, uh, to ensuring that uh, apprenticeships as a, as a post-school option uh, are something that uh, more young people are uh, aware of. Uh, we uh, want to, to see that further rolled out. Of course, one of the ways that we uh, can achieve that better is through uh, broadening uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the careers guidance, careers and information guidance that uh, is offered by Skills Development Scotland in uh, the school environment, ensuring that it's offered earlier, so young people are thinking about it as an option uh, earlier in uh, their uh, experience of uh, secondary education, so that they're uh, considering the, the subjects they may choose with uh, an apprenticeship as a possible outcome. And one of the big game changes, I believe, will of course be the provision of foundation uh, apprenticeships in the school uh, environment as well and there's been a substantial increase in uh, their number over the, the past uh, number of years so two years ago we were offering something in the region of about 340 odd uh, starts for foundation apprenticeships in our schools over a, a limited number of frameworks uh, this year we've had about 1200 uh, young people start a foundation apprenticeship over 10 uh, frameworks uh, and this coming year it will be offering something in the region of 2,600 uh, foundation apprenticeship opportunities uh, across all uh, 32 local authority areas. And I think uh, I'm right in saying about 70% of Scotland schools. So there's still some work to be done in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, every young person in Scotland uh, has that opportunity. But nonetheless, we are growing it and we have a commitment to ensuring there are 5,000 such opportunities in Scotland schools uh, by uh, 2019. Uh, and that's a critical element of ensuring by its very nature, if you can begin uh, the pathway to an apprenticeship at school, uh, then it's going to open up people's minds to uh, the possibility of doing an apprenticeship after uh, uh, they've left uh, school and in of itself uh, ensuring that uh, there's greater parity of esteem in the school environment. Commissioner, if I might come back in. Um, I suppose my understanding of foundation apprenticeships was that it was that's almost like a slightly and a big supporter of giving young people many routes to succeed. I guess specifically for the, the young men that I was speaking to, they actually had um, higher passes in sciences mm -hmm. and they've gone into engineering um, apprenticeships. So actually it wasn't the foundation skills they were needing, it was being alerted to this, the apprenticeship as a route to get a, a high quality engineering job rather than university. So it feels like it's a different thing. I, 
than the foundation apprenticeship route. I might be mistaken, though. No, I, I suppose the, that was the point I was making, is why it's uh, a multitude of things. So it's about ensuring that that careers information and guidance is uh, better available uh, earlier on. Uh, and again, we may touch on the 1524 uh, Learner Journey Review, which we are uh, progressing, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, pathways into vocational education are as critical an element of that as they are to, to tertiary education and to higher uh, education. Uh, but I suppose the point I was making in terms of uh, the provision of foundation apprenticeships uh, is that it uh, increases awareness of the apprenticeship uh, pathway. And of course, uh, if you are successful in uh, 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 securing a foundation apprenticeship, qualifying through a foundation apprenticeship, uh, then we've ensured that that is uh, set at the equivalent level of a higher qualification. Um, so it, it might be that um, uh, the, the young men and hopefully increasingly young women who are undertaking um, modern apprenticeships uh, may have uh, gone up to six years at school and uh, got all their hires. Um, that's uh, something I'm uh, relaxed about in the sense of, it's uh, again, the DYW is about ensuring that young people have uh, and understand the range of options available to them. So if a, a young person, and again, I uh, increasingly encounter this as well, that there'll be uh, young people who have got five hires who have decided that for whatever reason, higher education, despite them being getting the qualifications to go to university, they decide that's not for them. They decide to go on to a modern uh, apprenticeship. But equally, uh, it could be uh, felt that uh, if those young people, for example, maybe they didn't have the option of a foundation apprenticeship, and they might have found that quite attractive if it had been available to them earlier on. So that's what I'm determined, that we uh, provide the opportunity for more young people to, to experience that early on uh, so that they can uh, begin their pathway to an apprenticeship at school. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Joanne wants to come in just on <coughs> foundation apprenticeships and then Michelle. Yeah, um, thanks very much. And I think I would certainly underline the importance, I think, of foundation apprenticeships and understand um, you said the target is 5,000 by the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. But my also understand that there's... Um, Skills Development Scotland Board was advised that the contracted number they were to deliver of 3,200 has been revised down to 2,600, which is a cut of 600. I wonder if you can explain why that's happened. What do you think you can do about it and to ensure that you will be able to reach a target of 5,000? I can't see how you can reach a target of 5,000 by cutting the number that are going to be delivered in 1819 by... 600. Well, we're not cutting the number that will be delivered. And it, incidentally, it would be uh, over, they're over two years. Uh, of course, it's 1819 they'll start. It's uh, up to 2020 for the uh, completion. So I've already made the point that uh, this year there were 12, 000, uh, 1,200 such opportunities to start. And this coming year, there'll be 2,600 uh, opportunities. Uh, two years ago, there were about 340 such opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you actually look at it over a two year period, that's an over 600% increase in the number of available places for foundation apprentices mm -hmm. to get that opportunity. I, I'm also aware of uh, the, uh, the report uh, to, the, to which you uh, allude to, uh, Deputy Convener. I think um, there's a degree of uh, misreporting uh, around those uh, uh, figures. So uh, what uh, Skills Development Scotland will do is they'll uh, contract for a certain number of available starts um, to ensure that they can reach the target that they have set. So they've got a target of just over 2,600 uh, to hit, but that might in, uh, involve them going out to contract for more so that they can reach that target. So can we just clarify what the misreporting is then? Is it your understanding that the Scottish De Development Scotland's board was advised that their contract number of 3,200 would be reduced, reduced to 2,600? Is that, or is that not the case? The uh, target of 3,200 no, the, the doesn't target, exist, the, and it wasn't the, reported to the uh, Skills Development Scotland that they would have to revise down the contracted number from 3,200 to 2,600. Uh, the target that was agreed between the Scottish Government and Skills Development Scotland is 2,660-something. Uh, that's now. Was there a contract figure before that of 3,200? I mean, it may be that... What, was, the, there a, was there an option? The, the Scottish Government never agreed to any other target. That's not what I asked you. I asked you if the, the, the Scottish S SDS had a contracted number of 3,200, which was reduced to 2,600. And if you're not aware of that, I think it would be good to get a commitment from that you would go and examine why it would appear that's what the board was told. 
Well, I, I obviously don't attend the Skills Development Scotland board, so I don't know what was said at the specific board meeting. I suppose the point I'm uh, trying to make is that it may be the case that Skills Development Scotland will contract for a certain number of uh, possible starts to reach the target that they've been set. The target they've been set is the one I've mentioned. So, the, the, so there is a target of 2,600. Right. Can I just ask then what action you take to, to, or what extra action you think is needed to get to the 5,000 by um, the end of 2019, given we're in the first quarter of 2018 now? So that will be the, uh, what we'll do in the next uh, financial year. We'll move to ensure that we uh, contract, or Skills Development Scotland, uh, contract for uh, um, enough places to ensure that we hit that target of 5,000. Now, I can understand that on face value it might be felt that that's um, something that it might be difficult to achieve, but I would go back to the point I made a few moments ago. Uh, two years ago, they put out to contract 340 odd, or achieve 340 odd mm -hmm. starts. Last, or this year, about 1,200. Next year, 2,600. So you can see the trajectory of growth that we've achieved that uh, we can be well confident. Yeah, I'm not just the, the trajectory. I would be concerned if the trajectory was slowing down, given the importance of these, I think, and the emphasis that a lot of people would place on pre-apprenticeship programmes in schools in order to draw young people in yeah. and give them awareness of apprenticeship and that kind well, of progression they might make. Given I've set out that there's been a something like a 600, unless I've got my maths wrong, convener, but 600% increase in uh, two years, a two-year period, I don't think we need to have any concerns about us slowing down our pace in, uh, in terms of reaching this objective. Okay, we're going to move on to Michelle. Okay, good morning, Minister. Um, I want to just focus a little bit on disabled youngsters and their ability to progress into work. Um, and through a number of visits I've been doing, and last week I was at the blind school, one of the things that's come out very clearly is the importance of habilitation for young disabled people so that they can obtain independence and are able to get into a workplace and hold down a job effectively. Um, one of the great concerns around that is the increasing lack of um, the ability to refer our young people to get places in special schools where habilitation is focused on. Um, and I know the, uh, Elaine Brackenridge from the, from the Blind School has raised the question of those who've got into university, who have got first-class honours degrees, who've got doctorates, but find it difficult then to get employment, and perhaps the lack of recognition by employers of just how, how hard they've had to work to get that and the barriers they've had to overcome. But also in terms of how um, the key performance indicators, Kozlo have pointed out that for for disabled people, for, for children who have been looked after and accommodated, some of those KPIs are being missed. And I wondered what the, the Minister's thoughts were around that extra support that is needed and what focus we should be giving coming up through school and the ability for parents and youngsters to get places in special schools where that habilitation element is focused on and really does prepare them for that transition to work. Well, I, I, my view... I mean, I think the first thing uh, I would say, Ms Ballantyne, is we can't look at uh, those with disabilities as just one group. There'll be uh, different uh, groups within those with disability Absolutely. who require mm -hmm. uh, different forms of support. But that said, uh, I think the uh, approach that we should take in the school environment isn't entirely dissimilar to that which we're taking uh, across the board. We need to ensure that uh, young disabled people, uh, young people with disabilities, are also getting the experience of vocational uh, education uh, as well. And I've uh, been uh, lucky enough to be able to be able to see how that happens uh, firsthand. Um, Linda Fabiani, uh, our colleague Linda Fabiani, asked mm -hmm. me to visit Sanderson High School in East Kilbride, uh, where they are undertaking some excellent work to support the young people uh, that they uh, educate to get that experience of vocational uh, education. Uh, indeed, my own constituency, uh, Glen, Glen Crime, uh, uh, school, which supports young people with a range of, of uh, uh, barriers, a range of uh, disabilities, uh, undertakes uh, uh, a fair degree of vocational uh, education. So we need to embed that uh, across the entirety of uh, our uh, school environment. And that includes uh, those that uh, support uh, and educate young people uh, with uh, disabilities and, and specialist uh, in uh, environments. Um, but of course we can't just rely uh, on uh, activity within uh, schools uh, themselves, because I think you've alluded to the fact that there will be uh, people who go on to 
um, achieve great success uh, academically uh, in the university environment, but then who will uh, thereafter struggle to get into uh, employment. And one of the things that uh, we, uh, our course, uh, are taking uh, forward as a, a government, it's the Minister for so Social Security who has overall uh, lead, although uh, I um, will be taking forward elements of the work through the uh, Disability Action Plan, Fairer Scotland. Um, uh, one of the uh, elements of that, or several of the elements of that, relate to uh, uh, employment. Um, we've already taken forward a range of uh, commitments to try and ensure that employers can uh, better understand the contribution that those with uh, disabilities uh, make to, to the uh, work environment. So. Uh, we already have run, a, 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 I think, a fairly successful media campaign targeted at small and medium enterprises to uh, talk to them of the benefits of taking on those with a disability. We've established a, a workplace equality fund which, uh, of some £500,000, which is uh, open uh, for bids, uh, the first round of which will close at the end of this uh, month, the second round of which will open in June, which is designed to uh, secure and foster uh, better diversity in uh, the workplace. Uh, and of course, there are other initiatives we uh, have uh, supported uh, as well for, for other uh, um, groups. Uh, for example, through uh, Enable Scotland Stepping Up programme, uh, we have uh, worked uh, uh, across a number of uh, secondary schools, 70 secondary schools uh, across 11 uh, local uh, authorities. Uh, that's supported uh, through the 14 to 19 fund that we provide funding for, which is delivered through Inspiring Scotland, working with young people with learning disability, which has achieved 98% positive destinations. So we need to learn from that and better roll that out. But I think the fundamental point, the fundamental point in relation to your question, is that we need to ensure attitudinal change amongst employers, and that's activity we will be taking forward in the back of. Fair Scotland. One of the things that we'll be doing next month is having a, a summit on um, uh, employment for those with a disability, uh, and uh, a considerable focus on for that summit will be in this area in terms of changing attitudes of not all employers. There are many employers out there doing uh, good work, but um, clearly in terms of the employment rate, the uh, gap we see in terms of those with a disability in employment uh, by comparison to the uh, overall employment rate. Uh, there's still some way to go. Right. So, so does the minister think that enough is, is being done through the educational years for these young people, that in terms of habilitation, in terms of um, building their confidence um, as they go through their education, that they are ready and prepared to go into the workplace? Because you seem to be saying that you feel the problem is about employers and, and the workplace needing support and change. But I'm concerned about whether the, the young people are getting the necessary habilitation so that they themselves are ready and able as well as, as the employers at the other end needing to then open their doors and be more understanding and, and be able to work with them. No, I mean, it's both, I suppose, I was making that point in the back of mm. your question on behalf of the, the head teacher at the Royal Blind School mm. making the point, the reasonable point about the the difficulties some of the, the young people that she has been involved in educating who mm. do go on to um, a, a, a good academic attainment mm. post-school still struggling to get into employment so that's why i was uh, referring mm. to that but no i would absolutely uh, recognize there's still a, a job of work to be done in uh, the across the entirety of the school environment ensuring that uh, vocational pathways are better understood uh, that's uh, true the entirety of the of uh, the school population, but uh, in particular for those who uh, face uh, additional barriers uh, to getting into the labour market, and uh, quite clearly through the evidence before us, through the, uh, the statistics about participation in the labour market, uh, that includes those with this disability. Yes, and certainly those who have gone on to do extremely well have, have often benefited from the very things I was just talking about in terms of habilitation, mm -hmm. and they have been able to develop their skills and actually mm -hmm. um, go on to progress. Um, but I do think we have a gap there, and, and I think it's something that, uh, as, as Minister for Employability and Training, the consideration of what comes before that transition period is going to be really important. No, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't disagree. Um, work is underway, but there is more to be done. Uh, Gillian, and Thank followed you. by Mary.
I'm going to ask some of the questions that uh, people have written in to us about, as well as some, as you would expect, North East related questions. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I've got a, a question from Megan here, who emailed the committee, um, who has got a background in employability programmes um, and working with young people to get them into work. Um, she wants to ask um, how to encourage people who are not quite ready for work to consider um, employability programmes as a valuable option. She says there used to be pre-apprenticeship courses to help with transitions, sometimes run by local authorities, um, which were a good starting point with work tasters, induction assessment process and employability skills. Now there are activity agreements, but young people don't always buy into them, especially if they're not eligible for an EMA and the progression into work is not obvious. So she wants to ask, are there any plans to invest more funds into employability programmes? Um, and if I can just add a little other extra question of my own onto that, which is a similar question to what I, uh, which I asked the Minister for, for uh, Further and Higher Education last week, around EU social fund money, which has been funding a lot of these employability programmes in colleges, the gap that will exist when that's gone, how is that, is that going to be filled by, by Scottish Government? How is that going to be filled? It will take him the, the last point. Clearly, that is uh, an issue of concern to us as an administration. It's a, an issue of considerable concern to uh, those who draw down on ESF. Um, right now, we're seeking greater clarity from the UK government about how they uh, might uh, seek to uh, bridge the gap in terms of uh, ESF uh, funding. So we await further clarity on that. Um, so I'm not going to uh, presume that uh, they might not breach uh, the gap. Well, sorry, that they won't breach the gap. Uh, we do need to consider that they might not. And in such circumstances, then we'll need to, uh, to look at our own uh, budget settlements and how we will continue to take forward uh, the, the range of programmes that we uh, offer. Um, this coming year, we've uh, maintained uh, funding for uh, the range of, of employability uh, programmes that we uh, provide, uh, by and large. Um, I am clear that they are making a considerable difference in terms of those, uh, not just young people, but usually uh, young people, uh, given the, uh, the focus of them. Uh, um, they are making considerable difference in terms of making them uh, more ready to uh, engage with, uh, if not quite the, the world of work immediately, but other programmes that can uh, get them uh, closer to the uh, labour market. Um, uh, the, it does begin a, a wider question, because we are in a, a new period in that uh, next month uh, the, uh, the employment programme that I have responsibility for, Fair Start Scotland, will be uh, going uh, live. Uh, that in itself is a significant investment from the Scottish Government. It's a £96 million uh, set of contracts over a three-year uh, referral uh, period. Uh, and that, uh, along with the uh, point that was made by Naomi Eisenstadt, who it was talking about, um, I think she used the term, the cluttered nature of uh, employment services. It does, uh, I think, cause us to, to consider how uh, they interact and work better uh, with one another. One of the things I was very clear when I first came into this uh, post was it was quite hard to get your head around the variety of different programmes that are on offer, each of them doing good things um, and achieving good outcomes in their own way. But I think there's more that we can do to make sure that uh, collectively they are better aligned and integrated with one another. And that's uh, an area of work that uh, I am uh, actively uh, considering um, and looking at how we can uh, better ensure that that uh, is the case going forward. Thank you very much. Um, and slightly related to that answer, I've got a question from Louise Moyer, who's the head teacher at Mackey Academy in Stonehaven. Um, she says that the role of SDS within schools has changed to help support the DYW agenda, which is also starting to bear fruit from my perspective as a head teacher. However, there still appears to be barriers to effective partnership working with schools through the lack of effective data sharing, mm. especially in relate, relation to destinations data, which hampers timely intervention um, and learning by schools. So our question is, how does the government intend to enable more effective data sharing between SDS and its partner agencies to support the learner's journey? I mean, my view is that um, the, the, there's legislation in place to achieve that 
uh, right now. Um, so there, through the uh, the post-16 education Scotland Act 2013, there is a mechanism by which SDS uh, can exchange data uh, with uh, uh, schools uh, and vice versa to to inform uh, the support that young people require in uh, the school uh, environment uh, and also how they might be better supported as they leave uh, the school environment. <coughs> there can also be information and data shared between uh, the Scottish Funding Council on a, a similar basis with uh, SDS. Um, so uh, my view is that there is um, provision there to allow uh, data share. Now, uh, I think your question is predicated on well, it's a question being asked on behalf of a head teacher. So I guess what um, that would tell me is that there might be a particular issue in that school environment. So uh, I don't know what that might be. Um, but uh, my view is that we have the, the, the framework in place to allow for that uh, data to, to be uh, shared. Um, clearly, uh, one of the elements we're looking at through the Enterprise and Skills Review is how this can be uh, embedded as part of of that, further embedded, better embedded as part of of the uh, education system. Um, but uh, you know, without uh, clarity as to what the particular problem might be uh, there, it's hard to to comment in great detail uh, beyond my view that um, that the framework exists. Okay. Um, now on to some North East specific questions. So. Um Yes, I know. I'm sorry, I, I, will, I will try and stop myself. So, of course, the Minister will know that um, we have a situation in uh, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen um, where we are feeling the after effects of the lower oil price, although it's starting to recover. And there has been a lot of work done by the Scottish Government to um, give funding to transition training, for example. Um, but Aberdeen uh, Chamber and Grampian Chamber of Con Commerce are asking um, how can the government support the North East in generating demand for engineering training amongst young people, which has fallen during the downturn in the oil and gas industry? There's a considerable amount of nervousness, I find, in young people in actually going forward for engineering because they now see it as a not the safe bet that it once was. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're now seeing an oil price that's coming back. We're seeing a lot of contracts around new renewables. There's lots of opportunities for young people in engineering. How, how can, we, can we foster that confidence? I mean, I, I think that will, the, the, is obviously an inherent difficulty in that I suppose some of these young people will be informed by the experience of their parents who they may have seen have had to uh, move on to uh, other occupations or maybe are struggling to move into a, a, another occupation despite the, the support we've put in place to try and facilitate in that. I, I, I think um, clearly what we can do is we can uh, provide the, the overarching uh, framework to uh, support young people to have the opportunities. So uh, to go back to the point about foundation apprenticeships, a significant focus of uh, that effort is in the area of uh, STEM engineering is, is uh, self-evidently part of, of that. Um, so there are um, opportunities for young people to uh, get the uh, practical experience around uh, the industry. What we need is uh, industry itself to be uh, stepping up and making very clear that the opportunities uh, exist. And the best way for them to do that is to engage with the developing young workforce if they want to influence it in the school environment is to actively engage with the developing the young workforce agenda um, and that is led primarily on a, a local basis by our regional groups so you know the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce will be well aware of the developing young workforce agenda because they are an integral part of the the North East developing young workforce group so uh, I would be urging them as a, a group to make sure that they are uh, better involving um, those uh, sectors that can provide engineering uh, opportunities to go into schools to say, actually, yes, there's been this difficulty in this sector. Um, that sector is actually starting to bounce back. But there are also, beyond that sector, a huge range of opportunities in in relation to, to engineering uh, beyond oil and gas itself. So we need industry to, to play its part to say, here are the opportunities. And we, as a government, through Skills Development Scotland, will provide the opportunities through foundation apprenticeships, through 
uh, modern apprenticeships, and indeed we've not even touched on graduate apprenticeships uh, uh, yet, uh, convener, but uh, increasingly through them as well. Okay, I should say that um, I, last week in Apprenticeship Week I went to Sparrows um, and met some firm, uh, former pupils from my old school as well who very much were taking advantage of the renewables uh, opportunities and the apprenticeships there. Um, so my last question is, the oil and gas downturn won't just have affected people who actually work directly in oil and gas, it will affect the people in other <coughs> sectors which have been flourished as a result of the, the high wage economy. Those people will of course not be able to take advantage of uh, opportunities to, uh, that are funded by the Transition Training Scheme. What would you say to those people that are feeling th the bite there that are maybe not young, they're not school leavers, they're not the sort of 18 to 24 bracket where they're older and are wanting to access modern, modern apprenticeships who might just think that apprenticeships are something for young people. Well, actually, we've seen a, an increase in those uh, aged 25 and above uh, taking part in uh, modern uh, apprenticeships. So uh, in terms of the age cohort, they are the growth sector uh, in terms of the numbers taking part in modern uh, apprenticeships. And we sought to facilitate that in a number of ways. We whilst bearing in mind the, uh, the recommendation from Ian Wood's uh, report, the Developing Young Workforce report, that uh, the majority of modern apprenticeship activity should be focused on younger people. We are uh, also uh, alert to the fact that um, there are employers who would like to see more support for uh, those who um, are in the, it seems odd to say those who are 25 and above, but uh, they are the older uh, cohort. Um, and that's something we've sought to facilitate where we've thought it's reasonable. So we've increased the number of frameworks where that's possible. And also going back to the qualities uh, agenda for uh, those with a, a disability taking part in a modern apprenticeship, uh, you can get uh, additional support across all uh, frameworks uh, up to the age of 29 and similarly for those with uh, care experience too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mary, followed by Richard. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, um, Minister. I wanted to um, pick up on the theme that Michelle Ballantyne explored around um, disability, um, and Gillian Martin has just touched on it in, in, in her final question. And it's around the um, ongoing and changing support that young people with additional support needs and disabilities often need. Because one of the things that I have heard frequently is young people that go into either apprenticeships or enter university, the support they need is there from the start. Mm -hmm. But because of the changing nature of their disability, their packages aren't adaptable enough to support them and they quite often drop out. So I wondered um, if, if there's anything in particular that you're doing or you're, you're, you're looking at something to make sure that young people have the support they need. Well, in relation to modern apprenticeships, I've just made the point about the enhanced <coughs> contribution rates so that uh, that additional support can be mm. uh, provided. Um, I, I should say, you know, the completion rates for uh, modern apprenticeships are high. Um, they are, um, and if I remember correctly, uh, that's going in a positive trajectory uh, as well. So uh, that's uh, across the board now. I don't know if I've seen the information disaggregated. Mm. I suspect, and I could be wrong, but I suspect it probably is the case that those with a, a disability, the completion rate will not be quite as good. But um, my view is it's still likely to be good uh, overall. It's still likely to be high. But um, one of the ways we have uh, responded, of course, is uh, through uh, the provision uh, of... Um, that uh, enhance support for uh, providers to ensure that they have mm. uh, that additional resource to make sure that they can support mm. support young people uh, to complete their apprenticeship. Would it be possible to get the disaggregated figures so that we could actually see yes, how many of, of um, course. young I'm, people I'm, with disabilities com yeah, complete? I, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to, to look for any information the committee would, would like. And, of course, that's the first request, Convener. And yes, we'll mm -hmm. look for that. Yeah, no, I think it would, it would be really yeah. useful um, to, to, to see that in, information. Um, the other um, area of question I wanted to ask you around was the actual figures for um, MA Level 3. Mm -hmm. Because the target's for 20,000 MA Level 3 and above by 2021. That's correct, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and th th the figures for um, Level 3 modern apprenticeships have gone up and have gone down over the last decade or so. Between <clears throat> 2003, 4 and 2005, 6, Level 3 were consistently above 20,000. 20, and then there was a dip 
in, in, the, um, in the figures for um, Level 3 modern apprenticeships. Um, and in 2009, Level 2 um, framework modern apprenticeships were introduced and they replaced um, existing training um, courses or skill seekers courses. Is that correct, yeah? Um, yeah. Yes, level two uh, apprenticeships are offered on, on on the basis that some employers may find them useful for mm -hmm. the, the provision of certain elements of training. So they are the foundation courses. The level two are foundation courses. Uh, so I, I wouldn't describe them as that because I think that could start to cause confusion with foundation apprenticeships. Okay. So are the are the level two figures in, included in the figures for level three apprenticeships? No, um, they're included as part of the overall. Um, modern apprenticeship target, but what I can say is that we are uh, presently uh, meeting the, the target we've set ourselves for, I think it's two thirds at level three or, or above. So we're performing at the level that we have, have sought to. So the, 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 the level two that were introduced are not included in the figures for level three? No, because they're level two and not level three. Would you be able to give us the figures for level two and, and separate them out? Well, they, they are already available separate, so um, if I go back to Last year, I'm not going to sit here with a calculator to, to work out the precise numbers, uh, convener. I uh, can send you the figures, but last year we um, hit, we exceeded the target of 26,000. We achieved 26,262 modern apprenticeships. And from my uh, memory, level three. no, overall, and from my memory, we hit the target that we had set ourselves of uh, some two thirds of them being level three or above. So the figure of 20,000 by um, 2021 is, is, is that only on level three or is that in inclusive with a percentage of them being at level three? Is this in terms of the overall number of modern apprenticeship mm -hmm. starts? So the level isn't, the figure isn't 20,000, it's 30,000. So we have an ambition of 30,000 modern apprenticeship starts by 2020. Um, we've set interim targets, which we have, I'm glad to say, Convener managed to hit uh, thus far. Mm -hmm. And we have said that the target for this coming year will be 28,000, targets 27,000 this year. Uh, that includes uh, at level two as well as level three and above. Mm -hmm. Because I'm keen to understand, and, and forgive me if I'm labouring the point, the difference between level two and level three and what is included in that figure for level three. Because um, it certainly was my understanding that level two is included in, in, in the figure, in your overall target figure, yeah, which yeah. would mean that yes, level, level two are bolstering the actual number of level three because they're badged as level three, but they're no, not because I they're inclusive of level two. They're not badged as level three. I mean, I, I, I can't make clearer, convener, that, let me say publicly here now, level two apprenticeships, while part of the overall target, are not badged as level three or above. I mean, I don't think it would be much clearer by describing I the I wonder if there's some confusion here three. where, with the figures in 30 and 20,000, because the minister's saying that two thirds of, your target is two thirds of the overall. Correct. Which would mean 30,000 and 20,000 would, would tie in with those figures for 2021. So we've got, a 30, we've got an overall target of 30,000 modern apprenticeship starts by 2020, of which 66% will be level three or above. Which would be 20,000. And the rest, will yes. be, the rest will be level two? Indeed. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, Richard, uh, followed by Liz. Uh, thank you and welcome, Minister. I had the pleasure of attending a Developing uh, the Young Workforce event at Murray College, organised by the local uh, programme uh, a few days ago. And uh, the, was a, there was a panel there of apprentices, and I think there was four or five people on the panel, and you'll be glad to know they're all female. So hopefully Murray's playing its role in tackling the gender balance, which is one of the issues that's uh, still outstanding. But in terms of rural areas, one of the biggest challenges we face in Murray is retaining young people to live and work in the area. Mm -hmm. And I was asking the question at that event, will apprentices play a role uh, in, apprenticeships play a role in retaining people uh, locally? And clearly there was a view that that would play a big role. Uh, I know the Social Mobility Commission south of the border is calling the UK government to develop better skills and education policies for rural areas, for young disadvantaged people. And I just wondered if you could comment on what steps you're taking to help address the particular challenges you have in rural areas, where there's perhaps a lack of large employers. Uh, also, that brings in the apprenticeship levy issue as well, which is generally only paid by, to 
be paid by large employers. So if you've got a lack of large employers, albeit I know the Scottish Government's not constrained by where the money's spent in Scotland, but just if you want to comment on that, that'd be helpful. Well, I think that's a useful first point to make. Of course, we haven't taken the decision at the apprenticeship. Well, we didn't take the decision to introduce the apprenticeship levy, <coughs> and we have uh, put in place uh, an offering uh, for apprenticeships that's rather different from what has been offered by the UK government in England, uh, so that um, you don't have to be a levy payer to draw down uh, on any voucher system or the rest of it. You just have to be a willing employer who wants to take on uh, an apprentice. Now, some of the, the, the challenges that I suspect are faced in the rural environment uh, reflect the, the lack of, sometimes the lack of large-scale employers. So there's sometimes a reticence from smaller uh, employers to take on uh, modern uh, apprentices generally, irrespective of whether it's a rural or, or urban uh, environment. But because there might be a preponderance of them in a rural environment, then it poses a particular uh, challenge. Um, that said, uh, the, uh, we see the number of uh, small and medium enterprises taking on one apprentices uh, growing, but it does speak of the need for us to uh, be constantly engaging with uh, such employers to, to get them to better understand uh, the great value uh, to them as an employer of taking on uh, um, an apprentice, the, the value to, to their particular work environment. I've certainly seen firsthand uh, the difference that can make to uh, an individual employer. In terms of um, the, uh, the greater support that we can offer for the rural uh, environment, um, one of the things uh, that we uh, have uh, done, I've already referred to enhanced contributions for uh, those um, uh, apprentices who uh, have a disability or who have care experience. We also, uh, for those uh, apprentices whose employer uh, are based in a, a rural uh, environment, uh, we've introduced a rural supplement that is an uplift payment to the training provider again to be able to uh, ensure that the additional costs faced for the provision of training for that uh, person can be uh, met. We introduced that uh, this, uh, this financial uh, year um, on uh, the basis of identifying um, specific local authorities who might be felt to be more rural than others. And this year, actually, we're going further, so it'll be available on a wider basis. Now it's not confined to specific local authorities. It's done on the basis of um, whether the employer's postcode is classified as uh, meeting the what would be determined as uh, rural, remote rural or remote small towns. So, uh, again, the, the provision of that um, rural supplement for the provision of apprenticeship training it will be uh, uh, more widely available uh, this coming year than it, um, it has been uh, this year. So that's one of the ways we're trying to, to better support um, uh, the rur rural uh, economy uh, in terms of uh, the provision of apprenticeship training. Uh, of course, developing young workforce uh, as well is organised on a, a regional basis, and uh, that will reflect the distinct nature of the economy of each uh, region. Um, so. Uh, that's why uh, the great stuff you'll be seeing through the Birmingham Young Workforce Murray is uh, because the people who are best placed to determine what needs to, to happen there uh, are those who are based on the ground. Um, uh, the employers there, the college there and the schools there. So uh, I've been up to see what's happening in Murray. I've been very impressed and I'd be very happy to return. Good. Well, uh, you're welcome back any time. And my final question is in relation to the rural economy and the wider question of skills and training. Um, as you'll know, Minister, I've raised with you before uh, the chronic lack of chefs and workers in the hospitality sector, which poses a significant threat to the rural economy, given that tourism now is such uh, a successful sector and is one of our big great hopes for the future, especially post-Brexit. But ironically, Brexit, of course, may undermine the number of workers available to work in that important sector. There's a plethora of measures underway, which I very much welcome and I'm encouraged by the interest you're taking in this issue. It would just be really helpful to have an update as time goes on as to what's being achieved uh, by those measures. And I don't know if you have any update just now, but if not, perhaps you can write to the committee with uh, an I update. Mean, uh, of course, I can <coughs> uh, do that, uh, convener. And I am. Uh, I remember the the question you asked, and I remember the very full answer 
or I remember giving a full answer, I can't remember every detail of the full answer I gave uh, to uh, Mr. I think it was the uh, longest Lockheed. answer in the history of parliamentary well, answers. The, the, the reason parliament. was to demonstrate the, the great range of activity we're undertaking, but this is um, a, an issue I, I am alert to. It's not the only sector that faces a skill shortages. One of the issues that we face at Convener, I, I'm very delighted that right now the labour market is such that we have uh, high levels uh, of uh, employment by historic uh, measurements and uh, low levels of unemployment by historic uh, standards. But that does where those sectors who face skill shortages, it exacerbates it because it's obviously easier for uh, people to, to find employment. And this is a particular sector which faces the double whammy because uh, people will be leaving it uh, potentially through uh, Brexit. That said, there is uh, some really good activity taking place in this uh, sector to uh, try and extol the virtues of it as a place that you can have a career. I think historically it's been viewed, viewed as something that you can be quite transient and you'll work in for a short while. You can't really get the basis of a, a good career. Now, with seasonality, of course, that will be the case. Some people will only work in it for a, a very short time. But increasingly, I see from the hospitality sector and through Scottish Apprenticeship Week, one of the, the visits I undertook was to uh, to Blyswood Hotel in uh, Glasgow to see, um, I think it was about 40 uh, plus uh, young uh, apprentices um, working in the hospitality sector, getting the, uh, the range of experience they'll need to work in that sector. Great enthusiasm uh, from them, and uh, if we can get more of them, then it's a sector with a great future ahead of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was. Good morning, Minister. Um, so Tom Hunter earlier in the week was extremely blunt about the problems that are facing many youngsters uh, in school, uh, not having the right skills. Could you tell the committee what discussions you are having with the Cabinet Secretary for Education and the Minister for Higher Education and Science about the strategy in government that is required to deal with his concerns? It, well, of course, we've, we're undertaking, as uh, you will be aware, Ms Smith, the, the 1524 uh, learner journey a review and that is um, specifically predicated uh, along with initiatives such as developing young workforce to make sure that uh, young people have the uh, come out of school with the skill set they need to transition to uh, the destinations they want to and the destinations our economy and society needs them uh, to. Um, uh, developing young workforce in particular has a role to play here uh, of course because uh, I think uh, certainly what, um, uh, incidentally, the, the comments may have been blunt. I don't think I uh, saw them, so I'll need to uh, catch up with uh, the, the blunt commentary that you are uh, referring mm, to. They were very but, blunt, Minister. Uh, 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 um, it probably reflects what we have heard historically from a, a number of employers about a concern about young people not coming out uh, equipped with the skill set ready for uh, the, the world of work. And that's what developing young workforce is, of course, all about. It's about ensuring that through employer engagement with appropriate employer engagement with the school environment, through developing young workforce regional groups, that they can give young people uh, that uh, practical experience of a uh, meaningful uh, experience of uh, the world of uh, work. Also through foundation apprenticeships, uh, that uh, experience of the world of work that they can come out with an accredited qualification at the end of. Uh, and that's ensuring that they, and also uh, those who educate them, uh, the teachers can better understand what employers are requiring of young people as they come out of the school environment. Uh, thank you for that, Minister. But can I be very specific about what engagement you're having with the Cabinet Secretary for Education and the Minister uh, for Higher Education and for Science? Because what Sir Tom Hunter is pointing at, and also several other employers, and, uh, including the Chambers of Commerce, is that... Uh, many of the youngsters who are coming out of schools don't have the, uh, th the necessary skills for what is a very changing world, and particularly in terms of um, the digital uh, activities and technological changes. Um, they're, they're being very specific about the need for a holistic policy that addresses this. So could you tell the committee what engagement you are having uh, in other senior levels of government in Scotland to address these concerns? Well, I'm, I'm not quite clear what you mean by uh, engagement. I mean, the, the Deputy First Minister is one of two cabinet secretaries I have uh, direct responsibility uh, to, uh, to and to who I work with. So, I mean, this is a, well, matter, I'm asking that, this is a matter that we uh, discuss uh, regularly and that I suppose I'm trying to make the point that developing the young workforce, which 
the responsibility for which I share with the Deputy First Minister. And I've made the point that he is uh, the person, along with uh, Councillor uh, Stephen McKeep, who chairs the, uh, the National Developing Young Workforce uh, Group. Um, we regularly discuss uh, the progress of developing the young workforce and, along with Ms Somerville, we are actively engaged in the, the 15 24 Learner Journey Review. So this is, this is, this is all an area that we are uh, in regular dialogue uh, around and that we are actively engaged in as our uh, programme for government commitment in terms but of the Learner Minister, Journey the, Review. These employers are pointing to um, some of the difficulties in, in schools in a younger age. Mm -hmm. where they feel that there isn't sufficient uh, holistic strategy to address some of the skills need in Scotland. And I would have thought that as a department, because uh, all our papers here are very cross-curricular in the sense mm -hmm. that you know, a lot of the things are interlinking, um, that there would be uh, a strategy to address some of these employers' concerns, because they're the ones who are at the cutting edge of what's going on mm -hmm. in business and industry uh, and in the job market, and they're I think, telling the government quite a blunt message just now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just to reaffirm to this committee that you have a strategy in place to deal with that and that, that you have engagement with bodies like the SQA or Education Scotland mm -hmm. picking up on the concerns um, because I think our job here is to scrutinise what's going on uh, across the whole gambit of education and skills. That's the title of the committee, after yeah. all. Um, and I would like some assurance that there is, uh, you know, a full-scale engagement about some of the strategic aims. Well, let me provide you with that uh, reassurance, uh, Ms Smith. The uh, developing young workforce isn't confined just to the secondary school environment, so it's also working in the, the primary school environment as well, um, albeit in a slightly different fashion, as you would expect. We're not expecting 11-year-olds to begin a foundation apprenticeship, but nonetheless, we are trying to ensure through developing young workforce regional groups that there is um, uh, uh, engagement between uh, primary schools just as there will be with secondary schools with uh, employers so that at an early stage young people can also understand what the, the world of work is like and can start to think about the options ahead of them in a in maybe a more focused way than has happened in the past. In terms of um, uh, the engagement the SQA, Skilled Development Scotland and the SFC for example amongst others, will have. Of course, they will be uh, cognisant of the concerns that are raised. I mean, Skills Development Scotland uh, actively engage with a range of partners, sector skills, uh, councils, for uh, example, to hear what uh, is required of our uh, skills uh, system uh, uh, from an industry point of view. So I think we have a system, certainly in terms of um, uh, the provision of uh, apprenticeships um, uh, across the, the full gamut, foundation, modern and graduate apprenticeships is now a, a subset of uh, modern uh, apprenticeships that is responsive to, to industry demand. Uh, I'm not going to pretend I don't hear from time to time uh, certain employers saying that they don't find that to be the case. Uh, invariably what I will do then is I will ensure that um, a discussion can be facilitated uh, between them and Skills Development Scotland who I find to be very responsive to that and will invariably meet with them very quickly to, to hear whatever concern they might have. Okay, my, my final point, Minister, I, I asked the question because this is in the context of this committee that has heard recently from SQA and Education Scotland, where I think on a cross-party basis we found it very difficult uh, to see uh, who is responsible for the overall strategy and the interlocking of how these um, bodies come together, particularly when it comes to the question of employability and skills. So what I'm, what I'm really asking in the context of these discussions that this committee has had is where that overarching strategy is uh, that involves your department, the skills department, uh, to ensure that there is not only a regular dialogue with these bodies, but there is a feedback, not just to this committee, but to the wider public. Um, because uh, you, I think you mentioned uh, Ms Eisenstein earlier in, in your mm -hmm. comments. Um, she has made this very point about the cluttered landscape. Mm -hmm. And what this committee is trying to drill down uh, on is exactly where the overall strategy is and where the transparency is and the accountability of that. Uh, that's the point. Well, I, I suppose, um, to be fair, not the SQ, but in terms of um, the Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland, and our enterprise agencies, that a critical element of better alignment of these uh, areas is being taken forward through the enterprise and skills. <coughs> Uh, review um, and that will provide 
uh, that um, uh, area of focus to make sure that their uh, individual activity is far better aligned with one another to that uh, purpose of ensuring that the uh, skills requirement are matched with uh, economic uh, requirement. That can, that can I, we think, be better facilitated by uh, the outcome of the, the enterprise and, and skills uh, review. But in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the transparency, I mean, uh, if there are specific concerns, and it's obviously incumbent on us to, to consider them, um, but uh, Skills Melton Scotland, for example, um, published their skills investment plans, their regional skills assessments. They're, they're available for people, people to see, and that comes around uh, through the process of active engagement with us as a, a government, in terms of us seeing this as, uh, you know, for example, one of the ones that was uh, most recently published in terms of a skills investment plans for early years in childcare. So clearly, given the government's ambitions, we've been involved in that dialogue, but also discussion with uh, the sector uh, itself. So, um, I, you know, I think we have a, a transparent system, but uh, if there are particular concerns, then of course we'll consider it. Thank you. Just be before I move on to uh, George, I, I think that part of what uh, Les Smith was getting at is that cluttered landscape that you talk about. Sometimes we, we found that the evidence that we've been given that it still is cluttered and we're not quite sure where the layers of responsibility are for, for decisions that are getting made mm -hmm. in regards to the things that what the Liz Smith and others have talked about. So I think that's really, in a nutshell, what we're looking for. And if there's any way that you can help clarify that situation by letter or whatever, then we'd be eternally grateful. Well, if you want to write to me, convene on the specific points, and I'll respond, yeah. of course. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. George? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. It's on the back of uh, Liz Smith's uh, question. It's, it's the fact that you'll not be surprised that SDS managed to do a bit of research last week and had me meet apprentices from St Martin Football Club. And, uh, but the whole point in Renfrewshire was that, you know, that was a joint programme with apprenticeships and schools and everything else that Renfrewshire Council did a while back. And uh, recently they've had a report where council employability programmes in Renfrewshire are ranked first in Scotland and are double the national average in assisting people into work. Now, is this not the case in answering uh, Liz's question? That it's that holistic kind of working together, you know, the Invest in Renfrewshire programme, which is the Council's uh, delivery mechanism for this, is in the same building as SDS and the Russell Institute in Paisley. You know, is that not an example of actually getting that to work together and decluttering the landscape effectively with the, act, the Council being proactive in that area? No doubt there will be other examples throughout Scotland. Well, let me say, convener, the only surprise from that question is that Mr Adam didn't announce he's sought an apprenticeship with St Mirren Football Club <laughs> itself. Um, I feel the test. Uh, I, I mean, the, the specific example that has uh, been uh, posited is, I'm, I'm aware of um, what's uh, been done in Renfrewshire, and it's, it's a good example. It's been delivered locally by um, uh, partners coming uh, together. And what we want to to see is where there is that type of good practice, others learning from it and saying, well, if it can work in Renfrewshire, it can certainly work uh, elsewhere. Now, that's not to say there isn't other similar types of activity uh, happening uh, in other uh, parts of uh, the country, but certainly um, where um, something is working well in one place, then I think it's uh, important that, uh, that uh, other areas look at that as well. And uh, again, if you go to look at uh, developing young workforce, for example, that uh, approach is uh, very much taken through uh, the uh, leadership of uh, Rob Woodward, who was the uh, chief executive of uh, STV, who has um, led in a lot of activity for developing young workforce uh, for us. He's uh, helped uh, drive the creation of the, uh, the regional uh, groups, um, and he brings together uh, the various regional uh, chairs uh, and also the the various regional leads. Each regional group will have someone who is employed to, to help take forward developing your workforce in a particular area. He brings uh, those groups together for that very reason, so they can share uh, good practice. So that's something we want to see uh, across the board. And uh, of course, it's not me that's uh, leading on this uh, area convener, um, and doubtless you've pursued it with the Deputy First Minister already, but through some of the education forms, through regional improvement collaboratives, for example, that's the the same philosophy there. It's about ensuring that people can learn from one another and learn what's, what's working effectively and, of course, sometimes learning what's not working quite as effectively uh, and adjust accordingly. Okay, thank you. And finally, Joanne. 
Thanks very much. The first question I've got is, is um, from um, uh, someone who's contacted us, a woman called Isabel Taggart, and it's really asking a question ahead of, um, you'll be aware it's Down Syndrome Awareness Week mm -hmm. next week, and she asks, in supporting young adults with Down Syndrome into work, does the Scottish Government have any plans to emulate the excellent support provided by the Down Syndrome Association to work fit in England and Wales? <laughs> Well, uh, just having made the point that we should always be willing to, to share good practice and learn good practice, then uh, I wouldn't uh, close down the possibility entirely, uh, Ms Lamb. What I would um, say is where something's working effectively in one place, then of course at the, the, the very least then we should be open and willing to, to learn from it. But I would go back to the point I made earlier, I think it was in response to Michelle Ballantyne's uh, question about how we can best support uh, young people with a disability, and I made uh, reference to um, well, the range of activity that will be taken forward through um, the Disability Action Plan um, uh, in relation to uh, uh, employment, but also it talked uh, talk specifically about the Stepping Up programme that Enable Scotland is delivering, which we have supported through our, our 14 to, to 19 fund, which uh, will be, uh, is working with uh, young people with uh, learning disability. Um, which will include uh, young people with uh, Down syndrome, which is having um, a, a very high success rate in terms of achieving positive destinations. So, uh, of course, we'll be happy to look at um, WorkFit and see um, how it uh, works in practice, just as I hope the UK government will be willing to look at stepping up and see if they thought it was working, uh, then it might be something they're willing to look, for, look at uh, as well. Um, the other uh, area of activity uh, that uh, is of relevance here is that um, we asked the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability to uh, undertake a, a, a scoping exercise to, to understand uh, the scale and effectiveness of employability support for people with learning disability. So I've referred to what is good practice, but it would be wrong of me to suggest that we're getting this right here because I've already referred to the, uh, the uh, low employment rate of people with disabilities generally by comparison to the overall employment rate and we know that those we don't know the exact scale there are different estimates but we know that those with a learning disability are even less likely to be employed than those with the, 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 the overall uh, uh, disability employment rate so it is incumbent on us to consider what um, more we can do there's a group being uh, pulled together to uh, to look at the, the recommendations from uh, the report that the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability pulled together and they'll provide recommendations to me in due course, and if the committee is interested, I'll be happy to provide more information. I mean, I think it might be useful to look at um, the effectiveness of some of the, the work you can do to support sheltered workplaces or people who, um, you know, sort of, you'll know the European Directive, I can't remember the number, which allows you to protect contracts in order to yes. ensure the support for people with, or disabled people. I wonder, I should know this, but is there a target within the overall target on apprenticeships for uh, disabled people? Uh, yes, there is. So through the Equality Action Plan, uh, effectively, we have said we want to be representative of the, the Scottish population, if that Sorry. makes sense. It's to be representative of the Scottish population as a whole participation in the Modern Apprenticeship uh, Programme. OK. So if that's clear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, OK. So it, 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 it would logically mean, then, that you will be putting more resource and effort, disp disproportionate effort, into supporting disabled people into these apprenticeships because they're so far away. The gaps just now are so wide in comparison between... Yeah, so there's, there's, there's been some growth um, uh, in terms of the, the numbers of uh, disabled people um, taking part in modern apprenticeships. Actually, if you look at um, last year, from the year before, it actually showed quite significant growth. Still not great figures overall. Mm -hmm. What I would concede and have to be quite candid with the committee is that I actually think that was probably more reflective of us asking Skills Development Scotland to be a bit more assertive in counting the numbers. So actually the, okay. the figure we had last year was probably just more accurately reflecting what was, was there, um, uh, what was being reported before. Uh, so there is still uh, work to be uh, done. Um, and that's why I referred to the, uh, the enhanced contribution rate for um, uh, those with a disability uh, taking part in mo a modern apprenticeship up to the age of 29. So we are taking uh, steps to ensure that we better support those with a disability 
into modern apprenticeships. The other thing, of course, though, we need to reflect on is that a modern apprenticeship, you know, someone undertaking a modern apprenticeship is someone in employment. So it goes back to the, the fundamental challenge of um, speaking to employers to mm. make sure they better understand the great benefits that mm -hmm. people with a disability can bring yeah. to their organisation. You come on to, I think, my, my last point, because I'm interested in, I'm old enough to remember when the only people that offered apprenticeships were local authorities during the period of the 80s when you desperately would have needed uh, companies to step up to the plate. They didn't, and there was a, a, massive, a massive challenge. So I'm interested in the extent to which your commitments influence the broader picture around good quality work and the business pledge, mm -hmm. um, and you maybe say a bit about that in a moment. And... But you will also know that I, mean, I heard what you said about the, the apprentices in hospitality. We also know there's a massive issue in hospitality around precarious work. Mm -hmm. Massive, poor quality training, um, a lack of rights, not paid a living wage and so on. So my first question is, what are you doing to create within the business pledge incentives to, folk do, proper, to do good things on training and apprenticeships and in particular sectors? Um, addressing that and we have this discussion before but I wonder if at least the Minister would commit to looking at the argument you know put forward by Unite the Union and others who support the hospitality charter uh, um, and certainly something I feel very strongly about myself that when we talk about positive destinations if that positive destination is precarious work with no training and poor um, you know, not the living wage, would you accept that in terms of creating incentive for business, it would be good for you not to count those as positive destinations? I'm not sure. Maybe the argument is you can't disaggregate it, but I feel very strongly it's a very powerful message for government to give, to say when we're looking at what happens to our young people, we will not define mm -hmm. as a positive destination a job that we also define as precarious work. I think the First Minister's on record as saying that is unacceptable. We don't have the time to go into detail of it now, but I wonder if you would at least make a commitment to look at that, because I feel very strongly the positive things you're doing around training, encouraging people to, to provide high-quality training yeah. is undercut when we define that kind of work as a positive destination. Yeah, I mean, of, of course we can look at it. I think, though, it does come back to the... I think there is a difficulty about disaggregating the information. So... Um, and, and that's been our, our early estimation of things, but we will look at it again. Um, I would caution against the, the view that how we count destinations would act as a, an incentive or a disincentive to individual employers, because, of course, it's not broken down to the, the level of employer X, Y or Z. I think the other work that we're undertaking in terms of uh, living wage accreditation in terms of the business pledge, an element of which is around investment in your workforce, um, in terms of investors in people, investors in young people. Uh, I think that's where we can make a bigger difference in, in relation to uh, casting a, a light onto who's operating good practice mm -hmm. and who isn't. And in relation to um, the... I think we've done good work with the living wage accreditation. We see that, uh, that uh, Scotland's the best performing of the four UK nations in terms of the portion of the working age population paid um, at least the living wage, although there is a persistent uh, group not being paid the living wage. We have um, a disproportionately high number of um, employers uh, accredited of the overall UK-wide figure. Again, I think that comes down to the efforts we've led. But now we need to move beyond that. And so the other critical difference we made, we estimate that about 25,000 people have actually had a wage increase as a result of the living wage accreditation scheme. But now I think we need to move beyond that. And that's where our next phase of work with uh, the uh, living wage uh, is moving on to, focusing and targeting specifically uh, the very sectors where we know um, there isn't um, the uh, same a commitment to paying um, uh, wages, investing in your staff. And you've, you've touched on a sector where we know this is an issue. Not across the board, yeah. because I've just referred earlier to some good activity taking place in the hospitality sector. But yes, there is, there is still I, a bad sorry. practice. So that's where we're taking that effort, I think, now focusing on 
uh, on a sector by sector basis. So I'm very conscious of time, but just to say that it clearly isn't just about wages. Mm -hmm. It's actually about uncertainty, insecurity, yes. lack of training, lack of guarantees of access and tips, yep. shifts that are very short, and all the rest of it. And my fear is. You can, have a, you can have theoretically a strong economy with lots of people in precarious work. We see that at UK level and we would regard that as unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that simply to define these jobs as positive destinations distorts what is happening in the economy mm -hmm. and which disproportionately impacts on young people. And given your commitment on high quality training and fair work, I wonder you recognise that there is, there's, a, there's a mismatch there and it's something that we need to look at further. There is. I mean, there's an inherent tension here between what we define as zero-hours contracts that are flexible in the terms of uh, the, that work for the employee, that may not be felt to be exploitative, and those that are exploitative because uh, an employee isn't able to... But specifically be because we're talking about positive destinations for young people yes. now, it may be a young person that is studying and does That's a correct. bit of work on the side. Well, they That's will right. be in, uh, counted as a student. That's correct. We're talking specifically about young people coming yeah. out of school into precarious work. Uh -huh. That being defined as a positive destination. It's not what we would aspire to for these young people. And, I, and all I'm, I, mean, I hear what you say, that you will look at this further, and it may be that I can um, communicate with you further on where I think I'm, I'm there's some further to work needs that. to be done. I, I wouldn't want anyone to have the impression, though, that the, everything that we are doing through developing young workforce, investment in... Um, uh, training through apprenticeships is geared to ensuring that people are in high quality work, not working in precarious circumstances, and are uh, properly and fairly remunerated. That is where the focus of our activity is. In terms of recording information, we know it's uh, more straightforward in terms of the overall working population through uh, the ASH uh, survey, where we see that uh, the proportion of people in Scotland working as a zero contract is slightly lower than uh, the UK as a whole, but yes, we want to try and drive that down further, where such contracts are exploitative. I think it is slightly more difficult in terms of uh, looking at destinations for young people coming out of the school environment, but I've made the commitment we'll look at it uh, without being able to commit absolutely to what the outcome of that might be. Okay, that would be great. And uh, it would be good if you would update the committee on your findings. Of course. Okay, in that case, can I thank the Minister and his officials for their attendance today, and I'll now suspend for a few moments to allow witnesses to change over. Thank you.
Right. Uh, the next item of business is a briefing from the Independent Care Review. The committee is taking evidence from the Minister for Childcare and Early Years next week, and the Minister's remit covers care experienced young people. So this session is in part to inform the session next week. We're also keen in general to hear the progress of the review so far and about the review's future work. And can I welcome Fionn Duncan, Chair of the Independent Care Review, Rosie Moore, Discovery Group member, and Kevin Brown, Discovery Group member. I understand, Ms Duncan, you'd like to make an opening statement to brief the committee on the review's progress so far and planned work? Thank you. I'll, I, it will be a brief because I've, I've sent you some information which I'll just talk to. So um, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation. Um, we're really pleased to have the opportunity to update you on the care review. I want to talk to you a little bit about the highlights um, from this stage that we're in at the moment, that we're concluding the discovery stage, talk to you about what we're actually doing now and um, share with you some of the things that we're planning to do next. Um, in terms of the briefing that I um, sent across, that outlined the methodology and also clarified the time frame. We're intending to aim to conclude the review in spring, summer 2020. Um, this is possibly slightly longer than I think people might have anticipated initially. And that's really because um, there was a huge volume of interest from people. Uh, we, it's taken us longer to get around all the individuals and organisations that wanted to speak to us. And some of the questions that we've been asking specifically of children and young people around what's your vision for care has taken longer um, to get to a point where we have a consensus emerging around a vision. Lots of the early conversations were really about fixing challenges in day-to-day -day life rather than what could the world look like. Um, we've been very clear that it was important for us to hear from as many diverse po uh, view voices as possible and in ways that worked for uh, individuals, so we have not been prescriptive about how we've encouraged people to engage with the review. We've been really open about that. Um, in addition to all those conversations, including the ones with the uh, workforce, we spent some time doing really detailed analysis of everything that we have understood. And um, at the moment, we are starting, well, we started to frame that analysis into a vision, a series of intentions for the review, a series of um, outputs from discovery, uh, which will be happening soon, and a series of inputs for the next stage journey, the more complicated areas. And all of those at the moment are being taken back to children and young people, our go-to groups, so that we can sense check what we've heard. So we're saying, this is what you've told us, this is how we've organized it, this is what we intend to do next, and this is what we hope to achieve at the end. Does this sound right, rather than us just thinking that we've understood it correctly. And that's happening right now. It's happening this week. We had our first ones on Monday, and it's happening all through this week, all this weekend and next week. And then once we've concluded that, and hopefully um, the children and young people that we're speaking to have told us that they like what um, the way we've organized the next stage of the review, then we'll embark on the next stage of the review. We're very careful that the groups, our go-to groups, are not made up exclusively of the 817 children and young people that spoke to us initially because we recognised there was a risk that we would have an echo chamber. So um, increasingly we're building new groups of individuals that want to talk to us. Um, so that's sort of where we're at. Um, there is more information in the, in the briefing paper and we are happy to take any questions on any of our work. Okay, thank you very much for that. That, that was very useful and it's, it was good to see so many people participate in the and the, the questions. Can, can I ask, before I invite questions from members of the committee, uh, I'd like to start by asking Rosie and Kevin for their views on how the care review has sought thus far to take into account the views of care experienced people and what they feel could be done later in the re review to achieve this. Thank you, convener. Um, following on from what Fiona said, at, at the end of the <coughs> discovery phase, the, the figure of children and young people that have been spoken to are sitting at 817, and that's not including uh, the new people that are part of the go-to groups. Um, half, half of the discovery group are made up of care experienced young uh, members, including myself and Kevin, and I honestly could sit and talk to you for, for hours about the lengths that I believe that Fiona and the team have gone to to try and hear the voices of children um, and young people that are either in the system just now or who have, have left. Um, I think the ways in which the team are trying to gather 
such a vast variety of voices um, is, is really admirable. Within the Discovery Group members, we've got uh, people with a range of different experiences, people in kinship care, foster care. So you've got that diversity within the group. And then obviously there's the diversity of all the different young people that the team are speaking to out with of the Discovery uh, Group meetings. Um, personally, I feel that that my my skill set is obviously there's there's my personal experience of of being care experience and my academic and my professional, and I think that it's all equally valued. I think that when people talk purely from experience and opinion and things that have happened to them on a personal level, that is not given any less credit, nor nor should it be. Um, when people are inputting into the discussions that we hold together as a group, uh, I've never I've never known Fiona to pass up an opportunity to to go and speak to any care experienced young people outside of the review. I'm part of a care experienced uh, young people advisor group for the Life Changes Trust and I made a passing comment to Fiona that we had a, a well-established advisory group um, of 18 to 30 year olds and Fiona instantly said, when can I come? When can I come and see you? And there was, there was no underlying motive. We didn't have an agenda for that meeting. She purely just wanted to come and speak to us, update us a little bit about what the review was doing, get our thoughts on a few things and then open herself up completely for us to question her. Um, and that was nice for me outside of the discovery group to resort back to being purely a care experienced young person myself and asking her questions in a, in a different role at that point. So I've, I've never known Fiona to, to be too busy. She will, she will make it, <laughs> make the time. Um, moving forward, Fiona mentioned that there's recently been the creation of the go-to groups. There's been a a multi-layered approach to sort of engaging with young people so there can be one-to-one -one meetings there's phone calls there's focus groups from across the country it's not um centered around any particular areas or the bigger cities such as glasgow and edinburgh um moving forward personally i feel that there needs to be a continuing discussion around how we reach some of the harder to reach care experience young people like fiona was saying one of the the principles of the go-to groups is to get new people so it isn't that echo chamber and I think that that's partly respons the responsibility of the review and partly the responsibility of of people across the sector of getting together and, and thinking how we can get those people who are currently under the radar and if that's an issue to do with um, data, uh, collecting data not being up to scratch or people not feeling able to disclose their care experience due to stigma or shame or whatever reason i think moving forward that's a focus that that i would like speaking from a care experience from person point of view that it's a a cross-sector responsibility um how i would how i would suggest doing that i think there's there is a lot of underutilized resources that people aren't utilizing for example there is the the recently there's been um, the creation of the champs boards across the local authorities. Uh, I think we're up to 19, 20 different local authorities have these ready-made groups of young people who own the care experience and are, they're there voluntarily to create change and they'd love for people across different parties, across different sectors to come and say, what do you think? Because the voice of young people is so, so powerful. And I think recently in, in recent years through the works of organisations such as Who Cares, um, Celsius, and obviously most recently the review, these young people are slowly being empowered to talk and to open up. And some of the messages that, that come across from them um, are invaluable. So moving forward, in summary for me, obviously to keep going the way we're going and for people to really get together so that after the review is concluded, it's, it's not just that's it and that it's people from health, education, mental health people, um, from different political parties really having that commitment to continue to engage with young people and listen, uh, because a lot of the answers are there. I think we've just we've just not taken the time thus far to, to seek them out, but, but they are there, I think, if people take the time. Okay, thank you very much, Rosie, that was really good. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Uh, thank you, <coughs> convener. Following on, uh, I suppose, from from what Rosie said, from my perspective, the the, the, the uh, scale of, of the review is fantastic in terms of numbers, um, but it's the approach that the the review has taken itself that 
that I, I am really proud of. The review has, for me, created the conditions for care experienced children, young people and adults to feel safe. Uh, it has been as relationship based as possible by working in partnerships, uh, partnerships sorry, with agencies and companies um, to make sure that children, young people and adults feel comfortable and confident in sharing their experience. Beyond this, the public statement uh, that was made that the, care the review will be driven by people who are care experienced is a real strength in itself. What we have seen as a result of this is Scotland engage in a national conversation about how they in turn engage with their care population locally. Uh, so for me, it's went beyond numbers uh, and it is starting to, to reach into communities and this discussion has been taken forward there. And, and the third element for me is care identity and the power of sharing and listening to stories. Historically, not, not long ago, uh, around five, six years ago, there was a, a reluctance to listen to people who were care experienced and the fear that their kind of declaration of, of, of their journey would cause or revisit trauma. Um, and I think what this review has done has created the conditions for Scotland to take confidence that sharing stories is a positive thing if it's done in the right way with the right support. More than that, this, this review for me has it's, it's, it's been tabled as an appreciative review. Uh, however, it has not ignored the lived reality. I've spoken quite publicly and openly um, a number of times about my own experience uh, 15 years ago and 10 years ago, both of my brothers died aged 18, one through suicide and one through uh, a drugs overdose, both care experienced. And last week, uh, one of our members at Who Cares Scotland, who was aged 23, also died. Her name was Katie. And this review um, has is listened and and, and is facing the, the, the reality, as well as looking at the, the strengths and, and adopting the appreciative approach. So for me, the fact that the review can learn from the past, that can listen to voices that will never be heard, um, but can also, more importantly, build and look forward to the future, um, is something that I think has, has real integrity. Moving forward, um, I feel uh, that the, the review needs to be um, care experience driven. So the question there was about how we've taken into account care experience people's views. And going forward, what I would like to see is care experience people at the centre of this as the architects, as the builders and the creators. Um, for many, many years, care experience people have been oppressed through fear, through stigma, through discrimination. Um, and this review is, is, is a marked change in, in, in a message to care experience people publicly that you will be listened to, that we will take your views serious, and that there is, there is real scope for you to, to, um, to deliver change. So I've got every confidence um, that this review will achieve that. And under Fiona Duncan's leadership, uh, and the fact that to date care experienced people have driven this and will continue, I'm both hopeful and confident um, that we will deliver transformational change, that will restore childhoods, that will connect community and create a care experience that's based on love. Uh, so that's it. You know. Can I, can I thank you both very much for that? That's, uh, Rosie was talking about the importance of, of uh, care experience voices, and we've just heard that very powerfully for ourselves. And so thank you very much to the two of you. Uh, I've, I've just got one question, I suppose, which is for you, Fiona, is, uh, is how do you get the request out for people to participate in the review? You know, I mean, and, and I get that. Uh, you, you're finding the next step is those ones that it's not easy to get to, but how do you make sure that there's enough people participating, which you clearly have succeeded in doing to some extent? Um, 
So we are trying as far as possible to work in partnership. So um, you'll see from the briefing that we have approached and been approached by lots of um, voluntary organisations, umbrella bodies, um, local authorities, charities that have a specialism in, in disability or in children or, or, or. Um, we're, I think we're building trust within the care experience community. So there's a lot of... Um, my, the meeting I was at on Monday night was people that I hadn't met before, but their friends had or family members had engaged with the review and decided that they could trust the review. So we're meeting new people like that. Um, the nominations and uh, representation process that we used to create the discovery group was really effective. And um, so both Kevin and Rosie represent um, other organisations, and we mapped out our key stakeholders and asked them to nominate or, or identify a representative, and that was very good at extending our reach. We use all the usual channels as well. You know, we're on social media, and um, we are we go everywhere we're asked to. So um, I have been all over Scotland, um, and uh, we turn up to every conference. As Rosie said, I invite myself to things. Um, I haven't had many people say that they wouldn't have me, but it has happened. Um, and we just make a point of being as accessible as possible. And we, you know, we're not working Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. It's evenings, weekends, it's whenever it needs to be. And because we want to hear from children and young people, it's really important that we're not um, compounding the stigma by saying, oh, you know, we'll be with you at Tuesday at 3 o'clock and you yeah. have to come out of class. So I guess we're just, we're working around people's lives to make sure that um, that we're present. And I, I suppose the, the last thing that I would say is we're listening and we're asking questions. And to Kevin's point, we respect um, the voices of the care experience community and they are going to be involved in the design, the delivery and the monitoring and evaluation of any care system. They have to be. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think we're, we're at a point where there's, we're moving from possibly into hope and belief, and I think that in itself is creating a momentum. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, uh, then Mary, then Liz. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thanks for being here and for all the work you're doing. Um, I wanted to ask Fiona, you mentioned that um, it was some of it was taking a little bit longer because um, I guess you know, talking about consulting people and going out to, to listen to their views and have them shape stuff is very easy to say, but when you go, people have their lives that they're leading. Um, and there's there's almost getting over the current day-to-day -day issue. And I would think specifically for, for, for Katie experienced um, folk will have will have additional challenges. It's 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 not the same, but what's I suppose what's in my mind is when we go um, and have focus groups with teachers and we want to speak to them about future plans and strategies, but actually what's important to them is the stuff that's going on at the moment. So how, how is it just time? How, how do you move past that and, and, as you say, build that trust so that people feel they can be involved in the building of what's coming, not just sharing what, what's happening at the moment? Um, so I think that there is a time element. Um, I think that the way we've structured, certainly the discovery stage of the review, is this is a conversation, so people don't have to find an answer to a question there and then. Um, so I met somebody um, through um, Who Cares are commissioned to deliver the Thousand Voices and um, everyone that takes part in the Thousand Voices gets a badge and I met a, a young uh, lady who I think had five badges. <laughs> she was getting to the point where she was ready to share the things that she thought we had to hear and she knew she'd been counted once so mm -hmm. she's not five of the 117 yeah. she's one who appeared five times and i think that's important mm -hmm. i think there's something um very powerful in the fact that um as far as possible we're ensuring that um the people that are involved in the conversations really understand the issues so it's making sure i mean that you've seen for yourself the power of Rosie and Kevin and I think you know the fact that Rosie did invite me um, willingly into her group and said you should you should be part of this conversation mm -hmm. means that 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 in itself makes it easier for some of those conversations to happen um, but I do think they have to be conversations it can't be any sort of right we've heard you that's it you've had mm -hmm. your view um, and I think one other point which is possibly worth noting now is um, we where we've identified hard to reach 
communities or individuals, we have tried harder. We've not said, oh, you're hard to reach and therefore we're not we're going to write you off as hard to reach. We see the responsibility on us to try harder. So we have both been wide and, and open, but we have also been quite specific and targeted around voices that we have to hear. And it's not just people that maybe, and children and young people that maybe wouldn't be, um, feel that they want to engage with the review. It's also where maybe they don't have a voice or English isn't their first language. Or yeah. So we're, we're very aware of all of that. And, um, and my, my final point is that, as, as Kevin said, we create a really safe environment. We ensure that there's always somebody on site if somebody is talking about something that mm -hmm. they feel is traumatic or is triggering something. We mm -hmm. make sure that we have all the support structures in place so that people are kept safe during the conversation and kept safe after the conversation. Thank you. Good morning, panel. I just have um, one question around harder to, to reach young people. And the reason I asked the question, in the last session of Parliament, I was, um, for a short time, convener of the Equalities Committee, and we did an inquiry into young people and homelessness. And we discovered that um, quite a high proportion of young people that were homeless had come through the care system. And they were homeless because the system had failed them, because there was no support, there was no clear pathway for them when, when, they, left, um, when they left care. Um, and and I, I, I remember evidence we heard from one um, young person who said they were, they were taken from the care setting they were in, in a car, and deposited outside a house and given a set of keys to their flat and told this was their new home. And they had, they had no skills to cope or deal with the situation that, that they were put in. Um, and I'd be really um, keen to hear that, that those young people were, were being in, engaged with and, and, and talked to because we clearly need to make some massive changes to the way we, we um, deal with young people that are care experienced to make sure they have the correct, the, the correct support and the proper pathway to help them when, the, when they leave the system. And the other place that we found young people quite often, and again, it's the failure of the system, it's no, it's no reflection on the young people themselves. They're in and out of the criminal justice system because they have nowhere else to go and they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with life, basically. So I'd be keen to hear that you're speaking to people that come from, from those situations. Um, we are, absolutely. We recognise what you've just said. We have been... Um, targeted around working with um, charities that work with the homeless community mm. to ensure that we're having those conversations. One of the things that we've identified is a lack of data around mm. that. So we see part of our responsibility in the next phase is gathering the data um, and trying to understand um, the scale of, of that. So we also have gone, uh, we've done work in Pullment and we have identified those areas and many others actually um, that are, are of specific interest to us. So we, um, in the next stage of the review, it's something that we are going to be even more focused on so that we can understand that, that issue. That's good. Do you guys yeah. want to add anything? I think we um, <clears throat> I completely agree that that is a massive issue for me um, that, that needs improvement. <clears throat> when I mentioned before that Fiona had been out uh, and spoken to the advisory group that I'm a part of outside of the review of the Life Changes Trust. Um, one of the big initiatives that the Life Changes Trust is currently focusing on is the idea of home. Mm -hmm. um, and a large majority of that initiative is the problems that, that you've just mentioned. Um, Fiona has agreed to continue to work collabor collaboratively with us as a group um, on the issues of homelessness. Two of my colleagues uh, from, from the advisory group were here not, I think it was several weeks ago, uh, providing evidence as well on the, the homelessness issues. Um, and when Fiona's been out to speak, speak to us as a group, that has been one of the things that we have uh, discussed at quite some length. Uh, we also discuss it when Fiona's not there and, and feedback through myself being involved in both uh, or through uh, emails, phone calls, updates. Um, but just, just from... From that angle, I can definitely say that, that Fiona and the team are, are considering homelessness and the issues that being expected to run your own tenancy mm -hmm. at 16, mm -hmm. which is, is, is common sense that that's, it's not 
going to be easy and it's, it's not successful and it does need looking at. But the review's definitely taken that into consideration as I've been part of those conversations with Fiona. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, fi I find this subject quite a dark subject and, and I'm hopefully going to be able to try and talk to this concisely so, so that it's understood. When we, or government, in, increased the age of remaining in care up to 21 and then 26, which was monumental um, and, and definitely the, the right thing to do, um, we've done that in 2014. And we've, at the moment, there's a, a, a coalition of kind of key partners in the sector, Celsius, Who Cares Scotland, Clan Child Law, a whole range of people uh, coming together. And there's a meeting taking place uh, at Parliament in the next week or so to talk about this issue. The fact that here and now, um, children from care still end up homeless mm -hmm. and the average age of leaving care is still 17. So we're not seeing an increase, mm -hmm. but it's, it still exists. And when I uh, joined this, so it's so it's this issue has come up during the review process, um, and 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 it's multi-layered, um, and it's also come up um, in my role at Who Cares Scotland, managing our national corporate parent and training program. And one of the things that I found fascinating is that all of the reasons were different. So for a foster carer, it was the fact that they were registered as a foster carer and their foster care rate was being halved. So they then couldn't look after that mm -hmm. child. So they then moved on. Um, for another agency, it was the fact that uh, they provided residential childcare. It was at a certain rate. So some of it was to do with money and resource. And, 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 and there was a, a whole range of reasons. Um, some of it, when we spoke to professionals and agencies, was when I asked them, I said, I think this issue is bigger than finance. There's actually something very dark uh, and cultural about this issue because the conversation we had in that room was not how are we discussing, we, are we discussing this young person is potentially going to be homeless the discussion we were having was these young people are homeless, so the foster carers let them go, the legal agency comes in and tries to support them at the latter end, Who Cares Scotland is an advocacy service, the residential house that had held them for seven years, ten years, and people that say that they love their children are letting them go. So for me, there are some real challenges that exist that we need to understand better, um, but it's a really... It's a really dark issue that, that, that talks about behaviour and society and culture um, when we take children from abuse and neglect, bring them into the system and at the end return them mm -hmm. in a, a very disruptive, unsupportive environment. So it's beyond finance and I think that moving forward uh, in the next stage of the review, how, how we understand the culture and examine that despite the fact we all know it's wrong, we collectively let it happen. And that's not about blame, that's just about yeah. the, ref the reflection of where we are uh, at this moment in time. Yeah. Thanks thank very you. much for that, Elaz. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your very insightful uh, comments this morning. Um, could I just ask one question about the engagement of the 32 local authorities, which you said were in the discovery programme? Did you get a good level of engagement from all 32, or was it patchy? Um, it was... They were all willing to engage. <laughs> um, but the level of engagement at each one was possibly different. Um, some of them we engaged at multi-levels. So we engaged with CHAMPS boards, we engaged um, with their social work teams, others held workshops for us, others encouraged us to meet children and young people. For some of them, we were th with them for days on end. Um, and others, it was shorter interventions. Um, I, I mean, I'm pleased that we've got all 32, and I do believe that we are at the beginning of a conversation with all 32, and I think that there is a willingness to engage. Um, we are trying to make sure that our engagement is wide. We're also engaging with SOLAS and COSLA and all the other agencies mm. that are around, um, uh, the Care Inspector, Audit Scotland, SSSC, all the other organisations that work closely with... Uh, local authorities to ensure that we can continue to have conversations with them. Thank you. Question from Joanne. Yeah, just to say, first of all, um, 
Thank you very much for everything you said. I mean, there's some very profound things there for us um, to think about. And for those of us who are um, a bit hard bitten about stuff, there have been a million reviews on a million issues in this parliament, but you've given us huge confidence that this is taken forward really, really seriously. And I think across, you know, whatever party people come from, they will be hugely um, encouraged by, by what you've said. I mean, historically, I taught for 20 years, and it was only latterly people talked, even with the fact that youngsters were in care. I taught down in Butte, and youngsters were brought down onto the island into care, and nobody discussed why they were there, even when they were trying to get back off the island. So mm. this is something that, you know, I, I accept that there's... Or I feel that there's been progress in some ways in that time, but this is really a, a very um, important moment. I wondered... I, I think you're absolutely right that care experience people, young or older, have to be at the centre of this. One of the campaign groups that have been very strong in the parliament have been kinship carers, and they've spoken up for the young people that they love and care for, and have really exposed a lot of the things that we are prepared. You talked about stepping away from things, the extent to which, as a system, we're prepared to step away from that, I think has been a shame on us all. Is, how do you manage potentially what there might, not so much conflict, but a different perspective of a care experienced young person and somebody who believed, whether they were a foster care or whatever, were doing their best um, and perhaps failed? How do, you, how do you see that going and what is the balance between those, some very powerful advocates on behalf of young people and the absolute centrality of the care experienced uh, person themselves being at the centre of it? Um. I'll try and respond to that, but I would be interested in Rosie and Kevin's views as well. Um, there's a map of the care journey, and it's, it's A3, and it includes kinship and foster care and residential care and looked after at home and edges of care. And actually, we've tried very hard to ensure, and you know, babies and children of this age and this gender and these settings, we have tried really hard to ensure that the conversations that we've been having have been representative, and that's with children and young people and the paid and unpaid workforce. So that includes um, people who are involved maybe through the children's panel, kinship carers, foster carers, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there, I've got three observations. The first is that there is a huge amount of consensus around what has to happen and the need for change. So there's a, a real appetite. It feels that the moment for this review is, is now. And um, there are certain things that everybody does agree on. I think there are um, inevitably and, and I, I would imagine that's a symptom of the stage that we're at. We're at discovery, we're crafting a vision, and we're understanding the roots and branches. I think as we move into the next stage, there will inevitably be divergence, and there will be inevitably be conversations about resource allocation and, and, um, and precedent and voice. Um, but I think one of the things that people do say to us a lot is um, they don't feel heard. So kinship carers feel they don't feel heard. Foster carers don't feel that they feel heard. At, critical points of decision making. Um, and I think there's nobody that I've met that doesn't want the best for children and young people. It's just where those tensions lie. I imagine that those are going to come out around specific issues, um, like voice in a, in a children's hearing, for example. Um, and I think at that point, we're going to have to understand um, and go back to really what's what's best for the child, what's, what's right for the child. Um, my final point in this is there's been a, I, there was some interesting um, commentary at the very beginning of the review where children and young people had said the system is designed by adults and delivered by adults and children and young people have now got an opportunity to um, make it better. And there was a young man I met who said to me, if you'd asked me, at the age, if you'd asked me these questions at the age of 14, I'd have given you a very different answer. So I think because we have been speaking to people um, in all sorts of different settings and all sorts of different ages. Then, um, and it's, it's, I went to the Who Cares summer camp and spent lots of time with children and got pelted on the assault course twice. <laughs> um, and um, the conversations that children want to have are, are really around what's not working now and mm -hmm. what they would do if their best friend was coming into care behind, mm -hmm. behind them or tomorrow. And I, I think in those sorts of day-to-day -day decisions and day-to-day -day issues, we're not necessarily going to bump into disagreements, I think it's on the bigger issue around where does responsibility sit, where does power sit, where do the resources sit, what do the risks look like, 
how risk averse are different organisations going to have? And um, to Kevin's earlier point, there are so many different pieces of legislation in this system that actually that's often where the creaks happen. You know, you, something has changed and it's considered to be a good and positive change, but actually there are unintended consequences or it's not taken up or, or, or I think those are where the, com those are where the disagreement's going to happen. Thank you. Do you want to go? Um, I hope I'm answering this question. Uh, for me, so there's a lot of young people out there um, in kinship care arrangements or looked after at home that don't understand that they are care experienced. Mm -hmm. And there's a real tension within the sector, um, within families, uh, about their ability or desire to embrace a label. Um, the real challenge for me is that if you look at the way everything is being built um, in terms of opportunities and support, a lot of it actually re requires that person to know that they are care experienced. So the fantastic work that the, the government's done in terms of replacing student loans with non-repayable bursary for care experience will transform lives. Um, but if that person does not mm -hmm. understand that they're care experienced, simply put, they will never tick a box and they will never, um, never receive the benefits of that. Um, and you can look at that if you look at homelessness in terms of getting priority, if you look at employment in terms of ticking that you're from a care experience background and a whole range of corporate parents um, automatically guaranteeing interviews and ring fencing jobs, uh, free accommodation all year round in some of Scotland's mm -hmm. universities. These are fantastic developments, but they require care experienced people uh, to celebrate their care identity. And I think that that's where uh, this movement um, is a very young movement. If you look at the disability movement, the LGBT movement, uh, there has been huge investment to get people to a place where they celebrate who they are and where they're from. And with the care experience movement, um, it's embryonic, but it's something that we're building on. So for me, I think there's a real challenge in supporting kinship carers but there's a bigger challenge in actually supporting those children to have a, a, a very positive sense of self, mm -hmm. that being care experienced is not a bad thing, and that by owning that uh, care identity, not publicly, but internally, they will, they, they, there are benefits that exist out there that we are creating, but it requires them to know that and to accept it and to celebrate it. And I think that the review, uh, again, uh, moving forward, this is an area where we need to engage Scotland in the discussion about care so that they understand it and so that people don't um, don't try and, 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 and hide from it. Um, I went to university for four years and the only time I told somebody I was care experienced uh, was in my last day because I knew I'd never see them again. Um, and, and that's a very real example uh, of feeling ashamed of who I am. Um, and I've only felt happiness in my marriage with my kids and in my job since I embraced who I was. So for me, it's personal and professional, but there's a broader and wider discussion. And I think that Fiona in the review can certainly, um, can certainly aid that discussion in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Rosie, do you want to come on that? Yeah, um, following on from Kevin's point, uh, another another thing that I think is important to me is when we've been talking about uh, discrepancies in data and not knowing uh, just how many care experienced young people there are out there, how many kinship carers there are that, that we don't know about because it's done in, in private family life. Uh, one of the things that, that I brought to discussion with the discovery group um, was stigma and not the stigma of declaring that you are care experienced, which is a mass, a massive uh, issue, which I believe Kevin was just talking about, but also the stigma of families and carers to come forward and ask for help. Um, we spoke about this in relation to edges of care, uh, families who are uh, providing kinship care for children and young people that we as professionals don't know about because they simply don't come forward and, and tell us. And I think one of the large reasons about that is the stigma of uh, being a a service user of social work. Um, so for me, one of the things that the review needs to continue to look at and that 
professionals cross sector need to continue to work on is working out how to reduce the stigma of asking for help um, and getting rid of the, some of the disillusions that people, members of the public have about the social work sector and the health and education sector. And I think a lot of that is coming from, from the media um, and misrepresentations um, of, of information. So I think some responsibility for that lies with the review and that's a continual thing that, that will be looked at through, through the journey stage. Um, but I think because the, because the review is independent, um, I think there's a general consensus that, that Fiona and the team and, and Discovery Group members, our accountability lies with the children and young people um, and making a better environment and upbringing and childhood for them. Uh, so stigma for me is, is one of the, the big issues that I'd like worked on, not only for children and young people themselves to feel comfortable uh, owning their care experience, but also to reduce the stigma of, of accessing services uh, and hopefully helping families that are on the edge of care. It's, it's that preventative, not intervention, um, that for me would be a goal working, working towards. Okay, thank, can, I, can I thank you very much for that? that, uh, that was, I think I speak on behalf of all the committee when I say that was very useful and very powerful uh, testimonies from, from you all. And I've no doubts that we'll be hearing from you again during this process uh, and hopefully later in the, the parliamentary session. So. That brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. Uh, we're now going to move into private session, but I want to thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you.